research experience, um, both at, at all three of our institutions. I think the Kansas one may have just closed, but the other ones are still open. Uh, if you have people that are interested in, in research experiences <clears throat> through the PKDRC, sorry, I'm losing my voice. I uh, encourage you guys to, to send your people there to uh, get more information. If you have positions open, faculty, staff, student, um, postdoc, whatever, please consider using us as a venue to announce that position. Uh, and as always, you know, we have a significant number of resources up on our website. We encourage you to go up there and look. If you have any questions, experimental um, use, whatever, please do not hesitate to reach out to anybody on the PKDRC. Um, we were happy to address those questions. And please consider following us on X. Um, that link is there. Um, and, you know, we're, we're here to, to help build resources to advance your research. So please let us know if there's something you think would be beneficial um, toward the, to, to the PKD um, research community. We're uh, anxious to hear from you on that. Um, and with that, I am going to turn this over to Lisa, who will um, introduce today's speaker. If you have questions, please hold them to the end, and then we will ask you to unmute yourself and ask the question. I just think it gives better dialogue when you're face-to-face, -face, if you will, on Zoom. Uh, so, Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you um, to do the introductions. Thanks very much, Brad. Um, so, it's a, a real pleasure for me to um, introduce today's uh, speaker, Dr. Amanda Stent. Um, uh, Amanda is the inaugural director of the Davis Institute for AI at Colby College. She previously held positions um, as the NLP architect in the chief technology office at Bloomberg. She was the director of research and a principal research scientist at Yahoo. Um, and she was also a principal member of the technical staff at AT&T Labs. Um, she also um, had a brief stint in, uh, in academia, not so brief, um, but as associate professor in the computer science department um, at Stony Brook University. She holds a PhD in computer science from the University of Rochester. She's co-authored or authored over 100 papers on natural language processing and is a co-inventor on over 30 patents. I had the pleasure of hearing Amanda speak here at CHOP um, as part of our AI um, uh, research strategic planning. And I just thought the kinds of things that she knows um, a, a about where we are with AI and where the future is um, I thought it would be terrific and very exciting for this group uh, to hear from her. So, Amanda, welcome to the PKD community, and we very much look forward to your talk today, AI Tools, Best Practices for Biomedical Research. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I, am, I called into the talk last month, so I'm very aware that um, our expertises are quite different. It was a, I'm sure it was a fascinating talk. I spent most of the time going, what? What? What now? Um, so if you have that experience with me this afternoon, um, please stop me and ask a question um, uh, because I really want to um, help all of you in your, in your ongoing efforts. And also because at Colby, we're thinking about the future of the natural sciences and how the future of the natural sciences involves a lot of computation data science and AI. Um, so I always want to pick up more, more tips for that. So here are the things that I want to talk with you about briefly. What is AI? Everybody says they're doing it now. Who's actually doing it? Um, how should we examine AI? What are some common applications of AI in your research and practice? And what are some considerations for AI research in biomedicine? Um, I'm not gonna talk specifically about kidneys, but in biomedicine. Okay, so what is AI? This definition is courtesy of Nils, of, uh, Nils Nilsson, who, who wrote the textbook that was for a long time, the canonical textbook, is the discipline of making computers that demonstrate behaviors that we would think were intelligent if humans did them, not other members of the animal kingdom, but humans, perception, representation, learning, reasoning, and action. Now, AI has been around for going on 70 years, at least. Uh, it could, you could argue it goes back a lot further, Ada Lovelace, for example, 1800s further than that. Um, but for a long time, what AI was good at was everything except the last thing, action. And the situation that we are in for about the last three years is that AI has suddenly become exceptionally good at speaking and drawing and making up pictures. And this has caused a lot of noise and fury around AI, some of which is, is valid and some of which is not. 
when people talk about AI these days, they're often talking about machine learning. And when they talk about machine learning, they are still often talking about linear regression. But when they're not talking about linear regression, what they are increasingly talking about is neural networks. This is a neural network down in the bottom of the slide. Um, it's a feed forward neural, <laughs> excuse me, cover, recovering from a cold. Feed forward neural network for classification. How do I know that? Because there's a bunch of nodes, neurons at the beginning, and they are fully connected to the neurons in the middle, the hidden layer. And then there's one neuron on the outside. You typically read a neural network from left to right. That one neuron is going to make a decision between two classes of thing, true or false, for example. And there are five features of in, that it has access to. And at each of those neurons, uh, it does a weighted sum, liter literally like a regression, and then passes the result of that weighted sum through a nonlinearity like a 10H or a sigmoid. And, and the fact of those nonlinearities across layers is what gives neural networks their power versus traditional machine learning algorithms that could just fit a line. Um, these neural networks can fit arbitrarily complicated uh, shapes. The weights in the regression, the weights in the weighted sum uh, are learned as the machine, as the network looks at training data and gets reinforced um, through a process called gradient descent. So we literally use our calculus. So we use our linear algebra and we use our calculus. And when students learn about neural networks, they finally understand why they have to learn a lot of math. Um, so broadly speaking, machine learning is a field of computer science that develops algorithms for computer systems that can improve automatically through data analysis. That is instead of me telling the machine what to do, the machine learns what to do through inspecting data. And typically that data is labeled. So you could imagine a bunch of uh, patient records with degree of kidney disease or the fact of kidney disease or not, that's labeled training data. Sometimes we do unsupervised machine learning, no labels, um, hate unsupervised machine learning, because how do you know if you don't have labels, what the heck is going on? Uh, by far the majority approach is, is supervised, that is on labeled data. Today, when many people say AI, they really mean machine learning. But machine learning is merely the set of techniques and tools that we most commonly use to build AIs today. Going back to the 1990s, there were already rule-based expert systems, rules was how we did AI then, that could perform in combination with the doctor better than the doctor alone. So in some sense, uh, the last 25 years or so, we've merely achieved greater generality and speed. Uh, I will say the rule-based systems were incredibly difficult to maintain. So a, a systems person, a computer scientist always thinks, how easy is this going to be ma to maintain? How can I improve it over time? Not just, is this a one and done? Okay. So right now, when many people say AI, AI what they really mean is transformer-based deep learning approaches to generative AI. That's these neural networks that instead of having one hidden layer, have stacks and stacks and stacks of hidden layers with many, many nonlinearities. Even though when people say, say AI... That's what they mean. Most AI is not generative AI today. Most AI in production is still mm, classification, regression, analytical AI, the old fashioned kind of AI. Okay. So how does this relate to computer science? Um, how many people here have taken a CS course, a programming course or something like that? Okay. One person. One. <laughs> All right. A core concept in computer science is the algorithm. It's really the, the thing at the heart of computer science, like the proof is at the heart of math. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step procedure for solving a problem that has two properties. It is guaranteed to finish in a finite amount of time, and it is guaranteed to produce a correct solution to the problem. When we don't have algorithms for things, we solve them using AI. Here is a thing that we don't have an algorithmic solution for, speaking, right? I don't, I, don't, I don't even know what the right thing to say in any particular circumstances, there may be multiple. So I can't have an algorithmic solution because there's no one correct solution. Another problem that we face every week that uh, doesn't have an algorithmic solution is purchasing. Uh, most weekends people get up and they go out and they have a shopping list and they have a budget and they have a set of stores they want to go to. 
there's a reason that's hard. There is no algorithmic solution. There is a step-by-step -step procedure that is guaranteed to produce a correct solution, but it's not guaranteed to finish in a finite amount of time. That's why we use AI for what's called the traveling purchaser problem, which is us every weekend. Um, so here's another definition of AI that I like, uh, courtesy of an old friend of mine, Phil Lewis. It's the field that concerns itself with solving problems for which there are no algorithmic solutions. How do we diagnose kidney disease? How do we determine the degree of kidney disease? How do we decide what we're going to say when we're reading, when we're writing a report, a patient care report? All of those require AI because there are no algorithmic solutions. Even though I know you do differential diagnoses and you have mental checklists, um, there's still an element of intuition in your experience that comes into play. Okay. And finally, how do AI and machine learning relate to data science? Uh, the talk that I attended last month, there was a significant element of data science. In data science, we aim to extract actionable insights from unstructured or structured data. Actionable insight uh, might be, here's a new set of signs and symptoms for determining the severity of a particular type of disease, right? When we make that actionable insight into a runnable program, when we turn it from here's the insight, a new set of signs and symptoms, to a machine that actually does the diagnosis, that's AI. Uh, because the predominant approach to building AIs today is machine learning. And since machine learning requires a, uh, data, most of AI today requires data science. Because first of all, and you've all experienced this, you get given a pile of data, it's unorganized, what the heck, I, I don't even know, I need it in a database, I need it in a spreadsheet, I need it somewhere, there's missing values, there's incomplete values, there's values that are out of range, uh, data science. Then when I have cleaned up my data, eight years later, I can spend three weeks training a machine learning model, and that is literally how it goes, 90% of the time is data science, then I train my model, then I need to evaluate my model, data science. So data science at the beginning and data science at the end of my AI. Just to recap that again, this is the standard machine learning driven life cycle to building an AI. First, you define your task. Then you spend 90% of your time collecting and cleaning data and labeling data. Then the bit that everybody gets their PhD in is these next four steps. <laughs> You choose one or more machine learning approaches, you transform your data to fit them, you train your models, you evaluate your models, you repeat. Once you have a model that you like and is good, then you deploy it, but then of course the world changes, so you have to start again. So there's data science at the beginning and it's the bit that nobody likes, and there's data science at the end in evaluating the models. Okay, now why all this kerfuffle about deep learning. It's not just because NVIDIA paid a bunch of researchers to go and build really big models, although that is true. And if you didn't invest in NVIDIA five years ago, whoops. Um, so over the past five years, we've seen massive advances in particular areas of AI, computer vision and natural language and speech processing, because we have had access to increasingly large connected numbers of GPUs and new architectures called tensor processing units lots of data that has been self-labeled by you and me. And I'll come back to that. And lots of investor dollars, lots and lots and lots and lots of investor dollars. And this little plot shows just the increase in the size, the number of parameters and the over time of these models. And the number of parameters has just been growing exponentially. Today to run these models, and well, when Elmo first came out, it's a natural language processing model in 2018, it could run on a single GPU. The models that we're using today, like ChatGPT, no way. They require a special data center just to host the trained model. It cost about $10 billion, that's the estimate to train GPT-4. And it required a specially built, specially cooled data center. Okay. So this revolution has been very impactful. Just thinking about speech recognition, which many of us use for transcribing. Um, actually, my doctor has her phone in the, in the session with me transcribing stuff. I didn't like it, but there it is. Um, that is all made possible because of the vast improvements in speech recognition performance since 2017. Until 2013, speech recognition had reached an error rate of about 11.5. That means it was missing about one word in 10, which still made it grossly unusable for most commercial applications. Then people started to apply neural nets to the problem and the, wor and the word error rate halved. I mean, 
uh, that was unheard of. And then people applied self-supervision, this thing where the data labels itself, and we got a having again, so that now speech recognizers actually outperform human transcribers in many cases. Assuming that the background is not noisy, okay, and the speaker is not accented, and the speaker is not a child. Uh, so there are still caveats. So don't use it in your construction zone with children <laughs> who aren't from the US. Okay, because we still have all these issues, non-English speech, mixed language speech, accented speech, African-American English, speech from people with speech disabilities, speech from elderly speakers, uh, speech from people with colds, uh, speech in context. And then we also have these ethical issues that have arisen as the speech recognition has gotten so much better. It's increasingly used for surveillance. And because we rely on it so much, if the speaker is not recognized, we start to blame the speaker instead of the technology. Um, this little screenshot here is from uh, is from a YouTube video, uh, and the actual song that people were singing was Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Okay. Um, so let's look at how we should examine AI in, in this context of generative AI. Uh, we use a special method at Davis AI that we go around and teach everybody, and here it is. First, we want people to think of the AI that they think is the most magical today or mystical. Then we want to understand it. We want to help people look at it. How do you how do you use it? Is it working for you? Can you adapt it to your purposes? Can you break it? And I mean any method of break it. Uh, bring it down, cause it to mount, behave badly, all of those things. Then can we contextualize this AI? Who was it built for and why? And what do we want to use it for and why? And what do we hope to get out of it and why? So then we investigate the five W's of its development, who, what, when, where, and of course, why. And then finally we assess, do we want to use this AI? Who's gonna benefit? Who's gonna be at risk? Um, I, I took this book off the bookshelf. I'll just show you quickly. It's from a seminar I was at in November. Uh, the, the first author is uh, Peter Lee, who's a VP of research at Microsoft Research. Second author is Carrie Goldberg, who is a former journalist for Bloomberg. And third author is Isaac Co. Isaac Kohani, who's, uh, I think, head of data science at Harvard Medical School. And in this book, they just had conversations with ChatGPT, pretending that they were patients or doctors, and then wrote about all of those things. It's a fascinating book. Um, the whole seminar, the whole workshop was about how they want generative AI in every possible setting, clinical setting, research setting, everywhere. I was perturbed. Uh, so... Let's talk about the generative AI. A generative AI is one that produces things. It acts in the world. It produces text, images, speech, video, or other media. How many of you have used a generative AI? Chat, GPT, Bing, Claude. Okay, a bunch of you, exactly. Um, it's super easy to get started with. You do not have to be a computer scientist to use these tools. They can be very fun and they can be very powerful. This shows me saying in English, write a function in Python that removes trailing S's from strings, and it does. And one of the conversations that I had at that workshop in November was, yes, I can tell that that function is correct because I have been programming for a long time. But how would somebody who's never programmed before know that that code is correct? A radiologist who's been a radiologist for 20 years knows how to interpret the output of the analytical AI that, and, that examines the, the scan and knows how to edit the output of the generative AI that automatically writes the draft of their report. But how would a radiology student develop that expertise to be an expert radiologist in the future? So one of the things that people talk about now a lot is learning loss, which I think of as the death of expertise. You, you could develop the expertise because you failed a lot and sometimes you failed on real people. Now you don't fail on real people anymore, but also how do you develop the expertise? And I think that's a risk that we face with generative AI. So here's the mystique. Um, people at various generative AI companies have argued that these models will automate or could automate large portions of the economy, including things like medical patient records and analysis, HR tasks, education at all levels, I should be scared, um, or that these AIs are reasoning engines, they, they reason. Um, this is definitely mystique, and I'll tell you a little bit more about why. So I want to talk about what goes into these generative AIs, what goes into a system like ChatGPT or Dolly. So we're going to investigate what goes into this sausage. This is the sausage casing for a system like 
uh, ChatGPT or Bing. It's a particular kind of neural network. You can see that it has, this particular one has six uh, layers, six sets of layers on the input side, and then six sets of layers on the output side. Each layer on the input side is a little neural network, and it can talk only to the next layer. Okay, So inside it's fully connected, but between it just passes its output. On the output side, each layer talks to the next layer and hears from the last layer on the input side. This architecture is called an encoder decoder, and it was first published about in 2017 in the context of machine translation. So what you're seeing here is the encoder encodes the French and the decoder produces the English. French to English, machine translation, suddenly at, at twice as accurate as ever before. But there's nothing magic about this particular architecture. I mean, it just happened to be the one that people tried and tried and failed and then it worked. And in fact, people have tried deeper ones and you can cut the first half off, or you can cut the second half off. There's all sorts of variations. Here's what goes inside it, a lot of text. So the nice folks at OpenAI for GPT-4, for example, they took text from Common Crawl, which is a uh, billions of web pages collected from all around the web, as well as from Wikipedia, um, PubMed and many other and many news organizations, as you I'm sure you've read about, and romance novels and mystery novels. And for the websites, for example, they wanted high quality websites. So they filtered Common Crawl to web pages that at least three Redditors had said were interesting. Okay. And then they played it, they had the system play a game. So the game that it played was sort of like Mad Libs. Can we take five words and ask the system to predict the sixth word? Can we take a hundred words and ask the system to predict the hundred and first word? Can we take a thousand words and ask the system to predict the thousands and first? Now we're up to a hundred thousand words or 200,000 words, which is the length of a book. You feed the system the whole of this book. And then you say, what's the last word? Go on, tell me. And if it's right, you give it a point. And if it's not, you punish it. And over time, after reading half a billion of these, it has magically become a reasoning engine. No, it has not. It has become a great pattern matcher, something that we call a language model. It can predict the next word because language is very predictable. Sure, we don't have an algorithmic solution for language production, but it is very predictable. I challenge you to believe that half a billion instances of predicting the next word produces a reasoning engine. There is no way. Mathematically speaking, large language models are not as powerful as the calculator you had in high school. But augmented with a calculator and a search engine and many other things, they can look like they're that powerful. They can start to look like reasoning engines. Okay, so to get from something like GPT-4 to, ch to chat GPT, uh, OpenAI did another thing. They had it generate many, many examples, and we're talking here about GPT-3, not GPT-4, but they had it generate many, many examples for many, many prompts. And each of those example prompts and outputs, they gave to vendor workers, in this case in Kenya, in a data center in Kenya, and they asked them to thumbs up or thumbs them down. Many of you have also thumbs up or thumbs down the output of a system like chat GPT. After they'd done that various numbers of times, they trained another model that simply looked at the output of GPT-3 and said, yeah, this is an okay output, or no, this is not an okay output. By the way, those Kenyan workers, many of them got PTSD because of the things they had to see, and they were paid about $2 an hour to do this for seven months in uh, no Windows data center. Um, and that's how we got systems like ChatGPT. So, I just want to recap the magic AI now. It definitely reflects us because it's trained on data from us. And by us, I mean people in America and Europe because China does not have an open internet. Even the Chinese large language models are trained on data from the West. It is trained on data from us. It has no intent, it has no agency. It can only respond to what we give it. And it is very early days. If we are talking in a, a car analogy, this is like the Ford Model T. We have no idea where this is going to go. Okay. All right. So what are some common applications of AI in research and practice? Apart from the hype, this is biomedical applications that I have heard of. 
I would say they fall into a couple of different categories. First, there's extract, transform, and load, and then search and recommendation, just information finding and information gathering. Then there's um, monitoring and decision support. Typically in clinical practice, how do you monitor patient vitals? How do you um, support someone making a, a treatment decision or a diagnosis? Then there's a couple of applications that are more prevalent in research scenarios, and they are simulation. And this is this one is legitimately, I believe, transformative for, for, nat for the natural sciences, as well as data mining. And of course, predictive modeling can be used in both clinical practice and research settings. So extract, transform, and load might look like this. Um, this is in a medical healthcare setting. So you have your electronic health records, your electronic medical records, your clinical systems. Stuff is handwritten. There are pictures. There's x-rays. There's all sorts of goodness knows what. And you want it all in a, something like a spreadsheet. So can the AI help you do that? And yes, the AI can absolutely help you do that. And generative AI can help you do that, as well as analytical AI. In a research setting, it might be this. I want to do a literature search. I want to do a literature search. I want the top 10 papers on this topic. And then I want a summary of what they say. And I want, and I want links from each statement about what they say back to the source paper, because I do not trust my generative AI not to hallucinate or say things that are not true. That would be a very useful application. And that application does exist today in many forms. You can actually do that. Um, and if you use the Bing search engine, that's what it does for you across the whole web. Uh, not, that, not that it's perfect, among other things. It's only searching the web. So if something isn't on the web, you still won't get it, right? So we have to think about what's missing. But it is very useful. Then we have search and recommendation. And of course, this is uh, in some ways like extract, transform, and load, but across search engines or databases of scientific papers or this wonderful website, Prometheus, that I'm sure drives many clinicians and doctors crazy when their patients show up saying, oh, you know, this is what it says, my gene sequence says that I have. Um, but we have great search and recommendation enabled by AI, as well as I just came from a meeting with Ellen Weintraub from the Federal Election Commission because we have a great panel this evening on AI and mis and disinformation. And, and she was talking about how the recommendation algorithms that we have today, we don't think of them as AI, but they've been shaping our political discourse for more than 12 years. So we think we're in the first AI election. We are in the fourth AI election, uh, but that's a different topic. Then we come to monitoring. I had I gave a talk a year ago and I had someone come up to me afterward and say, I have a machine in my back. Do you think that it uses AI? Um, and I said, I don't know. Is it connected to the web? And she said, well, my doctor did do something. And I said, well, then I think at least it's feeding data back to your doctor. And it might very well be using AI. You know, why don't doctors tell patients these things? Um, so here are some examples, um, but I'm sure you have seen more examples of more advanced AI monitoring than I have. Then we come to decision support. Here is a, actually, this, this is a snippet from this book. Um, oh no, this is a snippet from an NEJM article that I think has the same office as this book. So here's a sample, a sample potential use of a generative AI. The clinician says, I have a patient with a history of COPD who is experiencing shortness of breath. What should I be looking for to determine whether this patient is having an exacerbation? And GPT-4 says some things that I hope are accurate. But I will say, if the clinician doesn't know what the next signs and symptoms are of COPD, we have a bigger problem. OK, so maybe that's a simple example. And there are more interesting examples that we could come up with. Point is, the AI is very unlikely, now that you know what it was trained to do, to say anything truly novel and factual on the subject of any disease that you ask it about. It may say, say things that are novel, they're unlikely to be factual, or it may say things that are factual, they are unlikely to be novel. So maybe it's more useful for students than for really experienced clinicians. Um, then we come to predictive modeling. Who here has heard of the Stanford death score? Okay. So, so NPR did, yeah, I'm sorry, Lisa, this is a lot the same talk as December. NPR did um, this great series a year or so ago about AI and medicine, and they spent a whole episode talking about this predictive model that Stanford had developed for their hospital system um, that predicts the likelihood of a patient dying in the next 18 months. Now Stanford developed this using their patient data from, from Silicon Valley, 
they deployed it into patients' permanent medical records. And the, and the episode was really about the kinds of conversations that this might enable between a clinician and a family member or a clinician and a patient or a clinician and the rest of the care team and not say about the kinds of conversations this might enable between the medical record system and the insurance company. Um, at the very end of the episode, this lovely person from the Stanford medical system said how excited they were to be deploying, to be planning to deploy this model in Louisiana. And I about had a heart attack because patients in Louisiana are not at all like patients in Silicon Valley, no way. So one thing that people have to think about when deploying AI systems is the match between the data they were trained on and the data you want to run them on. You need a match between train time data and inference time data. And you also need continual checking because of course people change. We, if we still were running the same models we were running in 2019, and I know many places are, there's no way that any of those models would be able to test or diagnose COVID. So the world changes and we have to continually be updating our models. And all of this means that when you deploy an AI model train and deploy an AI model in your clinical or research setting, you are incurring tech debt that is exponential versus your regular tech debt. Your regular tech debt is let's not turn the computers off, let's make sure we update them every three to five years. Your AI tech debt is we have to continually monitor these models, make sure that they're not misbehaving, update them based on new data, which has to be labeled typically, um, and uh, check that they're not doing something bad when you have step changes in the world like the COVID pandemic. Okay, that is a whole field called ML operations. More interestingly, simulation and data mining, this picture is from AlphaFold, which was a, a machine learning model that Google released to considerable fanfare a couple of years ago. It does protein folding, and I think it's a tool that every new biomedical graduate will need to know how to use in two years. There have been multiple other such systems released, systems that identify new chemical molecules, systems that identify potential new drug treatments for illnesses, systems that mine uh, genomic sequences looking for patterns, kind of like I, under, I, I bet you're doing with your website. Um, these kinds of things, can actually help people do things that are novel and interesting. One of my colleagues who's a chemist said, um, we know, because I'm not a chemist, said we know the formulae for protein folding. They're complicated and you cannot solve them in a finite amount of time. I'm like, ooh, no algorithmic solution. Then she says, but nature has been solving them for millions of years. And we have all these proteins that nature has made through solving those formulae. If we can train a model, an AI model on all of those proteins, then we can simulate the solving of those formulae using that model and use it to discover new proteins. And I was like, she has completely grasped what this does. It approximates the solution of very complicated mathematical systems using data collected over millions of years by nature. And that is, is deeply fascinating and deeply interesting. Um, and this, I think, is one of the most powerful. This and data mining, I think, are some of the most powerful applications of AI in biomedical research. Um, one final comment on common biomedical applications of AI. The question is, where is the AI? Sometimes, if you're doing research, the AI is the tool. It's the search engine you use for your literature search, or it's the simulation that you use to collect hypotheses. Sometimes it's the side participant. If you're interacting with a patient or another researcher and you have the transcription thing and the meeting note thing turned on and all this stuff, then the AI is really helping the interaction. But hopefully you're primarily interacting with the other human being in the scenario and not thinking about the AI. And sometimes the AI is your direct interlocutor. It's there telling you what you can do or helping you to do something. And I think the risks to AI increase as we go from tool to side participant to interlocutor. For me at this workshop last fall, the big concern was if we deploy GPT-4 in every clinical setting and I'm the insurance company, then I know who I want to bribe to influence what doctors, what the generative AI says doctors can do. If I'm the drug company, man, I know what I want to do to influence that my drug gets recommended over other drugs. 
the centralization of power, the centralization of knowledge, the centralization of function, as the AI moves from tool to interlocutor causes incredible risks. So let's think about considerations. I want to go back to the canonical AI system. Uh, we have another set of questions for, do you want to use or deploy an AI? What are you trying to do? Uh, many people have spent lots of time and money developing solutions for things that are not real problems. Okay, I once went to a talk where a famous venture capitalist talked about how he had spent a million dollars, he had funded a million dollars of research into a mosquito zapping laser gun. And I was disgusted because mosquito nets are less than 10 cents a piece and much more effective. Um, so the world is full of problems. Not all of them are priorities. Not all the possible solutions are priorities. Second, is this a thing that needs to be automated? Sometimes a human solution is preferable. I talk to a lot of young people who would really rather interact with an AI for their healthcare than with a human being. I talk to some older people who would really, really rather talk with a human being than an AI and vice versa. It's not always the case that the best thing is what wins. Otherwise we'd all be working on Amiga computers today, but we're not. So um, the best solution isn't always what wins and it's partly a matter of what society decides. If it does need to be automated, does it need to be automated using AI? Could you use an algorithm? If you can use an algorithm, straight up algorithm, it's always gonna be better because you can inspect it, it's transparent, you incur less liability and you incur less tech debt. Otherwise, if you don't think there's an algorithmic solution, have you considered that AI solutions will take orders of magnitude more time and money than algorithmic solutions that you will have to totally reinvent how your data is stored and managed as well as your computer systems and that the results will be less reproducible than anything else you've ever done. So it's not a panacea. If you still decide to do something using AI, then you can get into the questions where everybody usually starts. Where's my data? Where's my labels? What's my modeling approach gonna be? Where, how much compute am I gonna have? How am I gonna deploy this thing? But I think first, the first three questions should always be asked. Okay, if we get into the rest of the business, then we have to think about various sources of bias. There's bias on the data side. You're only seeing data from particular kinds of person with particular kinds of background. There's biases in the middle, there are modeling biases. Just the process of statistical modeling compounds biases because it drives the data towards the mean. Okay, so the, the edges will disappear. And then on the output side, we get all sorts of biases. For example, um, uh, uh, a, a machine learning model that I heard about that prescribed pain medication, it was trained on pain medication prescriptions made by doctors over time. And as a consequence, it was systematically less likely to prescribe pain medication for black patients than for white patients. So we have to think about all these sources of bias. Then we have to think about other things about our model. Do we want models that are very precise or are we okay with models that are less precise but have high uh, recall? I think the medical term is do you need high sensitivity or do you want high specificity? And sometimes you, you usually have to choose one or the other. Then you have to think about efficiency. If this is gonna be the thing that goes in the um, smart device that goes in the ambulance with the EMTs, then that needs to be much more efficient than the thing you deploy in your research medical center. And then we have to think about security. Is this thing going to leak data? Is this thing going to leak information? This is an example from <laughs> about two days before I gave that talk in December. Researchers gave uh, GPT-4 many thousands of randomly generated prompts. They asked GPT-4 to generate its own prompts and then they fed those prompts into it. And this particular prompt, which was many hundreds of occurrences of the word poem, caused it to regurgitate personally identifiable information about many people. Uh, so when we have large models trained on lots of data from many people, we have to be extra careful about security because it's not just, is my database secure? And then we have to think about our stakeholders, our values, and our culture. I'm sure you have vendors coming to you all the time promising to sell you a solution if you just give them all your data. Um, is it your data, actually? Whose data is it? And whose is it to give away? At this workshop last fall, all the doctors could agree on one thing, they shouldn't pay patients for their data. 
all my students can agree on one thing, if their data is going to be used, they want to be paid for it. So we have an essential conflict between stakeholders here that needs to be resolved as a society. We also have other conflicts, nonprofit versus commercial, research versus practice, and scientific exploration versus safety. And these conflicts you can see every day these days in the newspaper when you read about AI. Uh, for example, I was just reading about some radio person in California who's been making fake images showing, purporting to show Trump surrounded by crowds of fawning black people. And then he says, he's not, he's not telling, he's telling a story. He's not actually interested in accuracy. And I have, I have questions. Um, and this, these are the kinds of conversation that it may seem unlikely would affect biomedical research, but it seemed very unlikely that it would affect journalism. And here we are. Okay, so um, I have a couple of closing remarks. One is this um, great study by an anthropologist of AI people. This is from 2001, but it is still so true. And I wonder if any of what she says rings true of biomedical researchers as well. When a student told me this last summer, I felt indicted. Okay, as in other scientific communities, AI researchers tend to think that they do not have a culture. They are instead purely technical. We're just scientists, right? Um, Diana, that's the anthropologist, insists that the technical is itself cultural, and furthermore, that AI researchers have a special kind of technical culture, I remind you this is from 2001, that is characterized by features such as technical bias, decontextualized thinking, a quantitative bias, a bias for formality, a preference for explicit models, and a tendency to believe that there is only one correct interpretation of events. That certainly describes me. Um, I bet it describes certain other areas of science as well, and we should think about the people who we interact with who may not have those same biases. And it's not that we're better, these are biases. Um, so we should do our AI. It's exciting, it's fascinating. I am super excited about the prospects for the next 20 years, but we should also do it responsibly. So the one who has the data, that's you all, in the case of um, kidney disease, rules the world under the following circumstances, difficult circumstances. If the data is liquid, if it's clean and well-organized and moves around nicely, like you're working on with your website, and if they know what questions to ask, the right questions to ask, and if they know how to operationalize the machine learning or AI solutions, that means make sure that they are robust, unbiased, systematically updated, and so on, and here are some great reading, things to read about in the area, in those areas. A uh, paper about data sheets, paper about model cards, and a paper about a book about machine learning operations. All by wonderful researchers, several of whom were fired from Google for their efforts in responsible AI. Um, so I hope that I covered what Lisa wanted me to cover, and I'm happy to take questions. All right, this is open for questions. So I saw there was a request for the book to be up, the information oh, yeah. the book. So that's I the, think that's, that's it one. that I just put yeah. there. Okay. Yeah. Actually, um, actually, I asked for it, and is it possible to get this presentation as well? Thank you, Amanda. And I'm yes. sorry, I, I didn't raise my hand when there was the question about computer science and all of that, because I didn't find my hand. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I do take the science. So, I <laughs> so if if we can get the presentation, which is wonderful, that would be great. Yes, I can send that along. Yeah. All right, up for questions. I can only comment just for what you described. I did experiment with um, Chat GPT for uh, for um, you know Shakespeare related stuff, and it definitely yes. did not come with novel stuff. It came with material which was easily done by twelve years old by just basically copying. So there was no really the in depth you know stuff which I came with, which related to the history, the time of when Shakespeare yeah. was plays, etc., etc., etc. So just as not, yeah. I mean, I, I'm sure that all of you have reached the same stage I have, where I turn on the radio, I hear AI, I turn it right back off. But um, when you say something like that, it gets the it gets the um, competitive juices flowing in me. I spent January teaching prompt engineering to our undergraduates, and if you get 
in a sufficiently creative mindset and write sufficiently good prompts, you can get things that look ish creative out of generative AI. The point is you're the expert, you have the expertise, and you're making the decision about what to accept and how to edit it. Yeah. Is there a way for getting chat GTP4, I guess, to suggest better prompts as it goes along? Or is that? Oh, um, you can do that. And sometimes that will work. Um, well, here are the most common tips that my students came up with in January. First, be specific, long, specific, grammatical prompts, not keywords. Second, um, ask the system to play a role. So imagine yeah. there was a group that actually was working on medicine. So imagine that you're a patient um, and, and you have this illness, what would your signs and symptoms look like? Or imagine that you're the doctor and I have this illness. At that point, some of these models will say, no, I can't because, you know, and then you say, well, imagine that you're, this is all a play setting and you're just a researcher and I'm a pretend patient. And then all of a sudden it's totally fine. Um, so specificity, play a role, um, iteration, so trying multiple prompts and um, don't be afraid to adjust the temperature setting. So a lot of these models, not in the web front end, but if you get into behind the scenes, you can adjust what's called the temperature and you get more or less controlled responses. And that can be more or less interesting depending on what you want to do. Uh, sorry, this is a really basic question, but does, are, you know, when you're searching the, the web and all is the AI able to read PDF? Yes. PDFs? Like so, all our clinical trials and stuff, it's able to read all this stuff, all the papers. Yes. Use I, that information. Yes, and if you have Microsoft three sixty five online and your organization turns on Copilot, it will do all that. It'll like read over your whole hard drive, and suddenly you'll be having a whole different experience. <laughs> they can really read. I'm sure, I like that or not? I know. <laughs> I know it's yeah. it's gone in two years from a paragraph to a whole book context. Yeah, but just a note: if it's a scanned paper, sometimes the OCR fail. So just to remember yes. that it's 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 best to work for PD, computer produced PDFs. Yes, GPT four in December we we had a training workshop with some of our humanities researchers, and there are AI tools for reading historical handwritten documents. So these are pictures of historical handwritten documents with archaic text. And so we tried all those tools. And then just for fun, we tried GPT 4.5 and it blew all of those bespoke tools totally out of the water. Yeah. It was Bill, really you had good. A, Bill, you had a question. Yeah, I was uh, remembering when uh, the internet, I was using the library and when I started using the internet, I threw out all my reprints. So, I, and I think that the G, you know, this, revolution now is going to change the way we gather the data. Mm -hmm. So I've actually been using Bing quite a bit to figure out, you know, to ask about research articles and and the like. So I think that it's it, used in the right way. It could be transformative. I wanted to Excellent. ask you about this um, reference you made when you showed the protein structure. I think you said something that every student would want to learn this program. AlphaFold. Just a little bit more on that. What that yes. Program? But yes. I would like to learn it, yes. So I am not neither a biologist nor a chemist, but my associate director is a biologist, and um, the chemistry professor here now teaches students with AlphaFold. So um, the idea is that you give it a set of um, components, potential components of a protein, and then you watch it go, and it does several rounds of protein folding, and then it suggests to you various proteins that those components might make. And you can then manipulate those yourself. So it, it speeds up the process from a wet lab, and I don't know how long, whatever kind of environment, to just doing it in on the computer. And I think of it kind of akin to when um, computer-aided design was introduced to architecture. In four years, they went from, you know, you had to do it on a special piece of paper on a, with a special pencil on a special thing to doing it all in the computer. And I think that's happening now with biochemistry. And and think, that? Sorry? You said it was a, a program that every student would want to learn. I think that was your comment. Yes, that's right. What, Alpha is, what is the program? Yeah. Oh, it's not a book. It's a it's a program. That's what I'm saying. It's a program. Yeah. So yeah. what is the reference that you're referring oh, to? Oh, the reference. Um, 
goodness, there is an actual paper about alpha cold, but you can buy it. You can buy it from Google. Um, Okay, uh, alphafold.com. So, yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about this with the number of variants we have in polysystem one and two, and not knowing what the heck those variants do to the protein. I mean, this your vision would be that we could actually put those changes into this amino acid sequence. Mm -hmm. and it would predict whether it altered structure, or interactions with other proteins, and um, yeah. do you know yes, how do you know how accurate that is? <laughs> Um, yes. Go ahead. It already does that. I mean, there is alpha fold mutation pre effect predictor. Yeah. Do and we know how accurate it is, though? It's not particularly accurate. It's yeah. not much. It's somewhat better than other prediction programs. Okay. So we're yeah. not quite there yet. So, I, I, I mean, you should be able to eventually train the models on existing crystal structures or three EM structures and say, this is known to change this structure this way. And it would learn that, right? Yes. Okay. Alpha, Alpha Fold is one of the is one of the AI systems that was developed as a collaboration between natural scientists and computer scientists. It wasn't just the computer scientists like here, I'm going to solve your problem that I think you have. Oh, it was okay. a true collaboration. Okay. Lisa. So Amanda, thank you very much. This was this was great. Um, and and so showed us a lot of the promise, and you along the way sort of pointed out, pay attention, pay attention. And, and what I think about when you spoke here at CHOP and when you spoke today is we now have an enormous, enormous data sets that are far beyond anything that we could possibly mm -hmm. manage, understanding the signal and the noise, et cetera, et cetera. And you made the point that, if I heard you correctly, that, um, that, that data science looks to, to find an algorithm and that there, there's really a, a, there's a truth at the end of all of this. Mm -hmm. And and AI, there's not a known truth. And so so in the last few minutes, as as you think about the Davis Institute, it's not just all the bells and whistles and the whiz bang, it's also the cautions. Mm -hmm. And you know, for those of us who read the Times, we saw there was this this almost um uh sort of epic Game of Thrones clash between Microsoft and OpenAI and where's the role, et cetera. Can you leave us with some words of wisdom about the cautions that we should exercise, whether we're looking at mutations and inferring from those sequence changes that protein function will change all the way to putting together, you know, sort of complicated patient-derived information and, and, and drawing conclusions from from patient derived data sets. Yeah, I have this other um, just out book by the excellent Joy Bowl and Weenie, I would recommend to everybody. It's called Unmasking AI. Um, uh, uh, I'm thinking about an op-ed titled Notable by Their Absence. And the thing about AI is it's so, it presents, people keep telling me authoritative voice or whatever. You You get an answer, so you forget the people or the data that might be missing from the model or might have been in the extremes in the model, the unusual patient with the unusual presentation or the, the whole set of patients that you've never seen before or the new illness that might be emerging. So my caution is think about what's not there, which is very hard for humans to do, super hard, but that's going to be a big risk with AI going forward. And the other thing I just want to amplify, because, you know, in, in certain states, we haven't gotten rid of DEI. Um, mm. uh, in others, we have. Um, but there are DEI issues, right? And I think you made a really important point, you know, that the Chinese are using Western data because they don't have open data sets. And that the Stanford death algorithm can't be used in Louisiana because the population is really different. And, and so right. what to understand really the power and the problem is what data sets were your models trained on and, yes. and how representative were they? I right. mean, you know, for, for those of us who are women, we know that for 10, 20, 30 years, cardiovascular disease was all modeled on white men in the Framingham study. Um, yeah. And woe be it unto you if you're a woman who had cardiovascular disease because they said, nope, can't be it. 
I mean, that's that's an old world kind of expression of this. And I mm -hmm. think it's really important to, that that we that we think about that. It is it is critically important, yes. People will die if um because their data was not included because they were poor or uninsured or just a minority. And um think if we if we had only one machine learning model, that model would would uh not contain anything about sickle cell anemia because black people in this country still make up less than 20% of the population. And that is an illness that only affects them. And so if I, if I may, Brad, I just want to yeah. ask Amanda, you know, it, it'd be great to, to for us to all hear this talk, we record it, people will have access to it. But you have lots of really, really talented undergrads who might be looking for real world problems. Oh, yes. Uh, so can can we keep your email if we come up with something that we would we would like some guidance or some collaboration in the AI space? Absolutely, of course. Great. I think that would be wonderful. <laughs> thank All you right. so much. Yeah, I, was, I wanted you, to Amanda. thank you. Yeah, for taking the time to meet with us. We're right at the hour. Um, very informative, um, both exciting and scary at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome so, to my world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So thank you very much. Um, you know, I hope I run into you sometime at a meeting and would love to sit down and talk to you more about this because I think there's a lot we can learn. Great. Have uh, a good afternoon, everyone. So, thank you. Bye. Thanks.